I'd like to talk about something that a lot of the people who have uh, heard my message from the Lord have experienced and uh, not too many but and enough for me to to make a video dedicated just to this portion they've asked me actually the people who have had dreams and visions regarding this from the Lord ask me why don't you make a video about uh, what the Bible calls the cup of wrath that the Father uh, pours out on the wicked and on sinful flesh it's the same cup Jesus asked for the Father to pass the same cup Jeremiah speaks about in his prophecies that says the Lord tells him to go force the people to drink this cup uh, it's not a personal thing. Well, it is a personal thing where the Lord pours it out on the person, but God the Father is angry at sinful flesh for sinning against Him in His temple, our body. Now, there has to be an end of sin. There needs to be an end to sin, but it's difficult because as a believer, we try to do what pleases the Lord, but our flesh sometimes inhibits us and doesn't allow us to fully express our spiritual selves in front of the throne. We're limited as far as sin and thoughts, especially evil thoughts that come up. I'm not sure if any of you have felt this, but you know, you try to pray, you try not to think about evil, and then more evil just comes in and it just comes in and comes in. And you get to a point where you try to feel some momentum towards God and for a time you might even feel it, but then it's fleeting, it doesn't last. And then you're filled with a little bit of confusion, sometimes even questioning if uh, you're saved. And the reason for that is because as a believer we have to take the complete message of the, of the Bible, of the Gospel. And this is the portion of my message that I call the meat. And not everybody is ready for meat. Some people need milk. Some people need just to be told, you need to repent from sins, stay in, the, stay in the scriptures, call on the word of God, who is Jesus, to come up, come to you. And, you know, that for a time works. And to get the person to the place they need to be to accept the meat of the message. Now in Romans it says, we are heirs with Christ, co-heirs, if, in, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may share His glory. Now, when I got saved in, in back, way back in 1999, I did not repent from sins, actually. I was in my sin, and I got to the point where I was frustrated with myself in my sin, and I looked into the mirror. I don't know why I looked into the mirror, but I was, from the bottom of my heart, again, was, as I had done previous times before, I asked Jesus to forgive me, you know, and uh, we were getting high with friends, you know, and uh, smoking weed, and I think we were drinking too, I'm not sure, but the point is that at that time I felt like the guilt and the weight of sin, you know, and uh, I needed relief, so I went and I asked Jesus to forgive me, and lo and behold, I felt this cleansing come over me. I was no longer in the bondage of my sin, I was free from that guilt and I felt light I felt you know free from my from my guilt Jesus just wiped it away as if it never was but there was a problem I was still me and sin was in my future so I went back to the room with my friends where we were hanging out and of course you know smoked some more now that I was free from this guilt I felt good again and feeling good causes us to think we're, you know, invincible in a way where, you know, we can go do whatever we want. But so I did that and then I went back to the mirror. I think it was, you know, 20 minutes later, I, I, you know, and uh, I, I think I kept going back to that mirror a bunch of times. But I remember asking Jesus that day in his house to destroy my sinful nature. I told them, asking forgiveness of sins is no longer good enough. It doesn't work. Because I'll go back and I'll do it again and then I'll come back to you and for a while I'll stay with you, but then I'll go back. And uh, to me, 
just the words vicious cycle came to mind. And uh, I told him from the bottom of my heart to destroy the sinful nature that I have, the sinful spirit. I, I thought there was a demon in me causing me to go back to sin. I didn't know. I said, there's a devil in my heart. The devil is in my heart and I need for you to kill him. And I need you to kill him. And I, my sinful nature needs to be crucified. You know, there's just so much I can do, crucify myself, but I need you to pour out something on me that'll make me wake up, that'll make me despise sin, that'll make me understand what I am and what I need to do to become holy. And of course, the only thing I can do is ask, Jesus, please. And I think I spent the next few hours crying out to the Lord while hanging out with my friends from my heart I would just repeat crucify me Lord please kill me kill my sinful nature kill me Lord crucify me Lord and I would just get more intense and more intense in that asking as the hours went by and I think a couple hours went by and I kept repeating in my mind Jesus if you can hear me I need you to do something right now I need you to crucify me I need you to end me whether you want to kill me or keep me alive, something in me that keeps rising up needs to die. And then I thought it's been two hours. In my mind, I thought this has been two hours I've been doing this. How long should I keep asking? And I decided, that day I decided I was going to go crazy because I wasn't going to stop. And then I had a flash of the next week or two weeks. And I decided from morning till night, I was going to repeat in my mind for Jesus to crucify me and to crucify the sinful nature and to kill my sin nature however he wants to do it. That was a decision I made. Whether I'd be walking down the street silently, we can all speak in our minds. So that was just a personal decision I made in that moment. And I kept doing it. I don't know how much longer. And here's the part of my testimony I've left out for many years. But, you know, I speak no lie. I tell you the truth. In that moment, in that, my friend's room, my friend came up to me. He showed me a little picture of the devil, I remember. A little cute, little cartoon version of a devil. And he's like, what do you think of this picture? You know, and I don't know what I thought of the picture, but I started thinking about the devil, and I started thinking about me, and I started thinking about Jesus, and how Jesus is completely sinless. Satan has been sinning from the beginning. And I... In my mind, I decided, I, I, a question was posed. Are you more like Christ or the devil? And the answer was clear to me that I was like the devil, as a believer. Even if I had one sin in my life, I was like the devil. That's how holy Jesus is. And so I brought my image in my own mind down equal with the devil that day. It was always Jesus was up here, devil was here, and I was kind of floating in the middle somewhere. But that day, the Holy Spirit taught me that me and the devil were the same. To accept this was very difficult for me, but I did it. You know, the Holy Spirit helped me. The Holy Spirit's always with us. He'll never forsake us. Jesus is always with us, and He'll never forsake us. So when I accepted in my heart that I was no better than the devil, the devil can't repent, and I couldn't repent from sinning. If you think you can repent from sin, then sin no more. But if you find yourself going back, then admit to yourself that you are evil. Anyone who sins is of the devil, it says. Anyone who does what is sinful is from the devil. You who know you are evil can give good gifts. How much more will God give His Holy Spirit to those who ask? So knowing I was evil and then to ask and receive God's Spirit, well that day, something happened, something terrifying. After my friend showed me that picture of the devil and I contemplated and, and I agreed with the spirit that I and the devil are the same and I'm not like Jesus, I'm not like the saints, you know, I'm not like the angels, I'm like a devil. And it was a tough, tough, tough pill to swallow and then my prayer changed to, well, kill this devil then, Lord, kill the devil and make me into like an angel tired of being evil. I'm tired of it. Lord, please. And I kept crying out. And I'm not kidding, but 
I felt the devil come. He was a spirit, just like one second, he was in front of me. I couldn't see him, I sensed him with my entire body and I heard him. My whole soul and spirit heard worship me. Three times he said it. And each time I said no. The third time he said, if you don't worship me, I'm gonna kill you. Louder than anyone has ever said anything to me before I heard this. Not audibly, but in my mind and in my entire spirit and just like, it's talking to my whole being. And I said, do what you must. I'm not gonna worship you. And and I was really scared of worshiping the beast and at that time as a Christian too, and I wasn't gonna do it. And then it was as if I was forced to. I had an image put in my mind like a picture. I saw it of me bowing down. I was resisting it, but I was forced in my own mind to submit, to say, hey, I serve you. You know, I didn't want to do this. It was against my will, but I was forced to. It was weird. It's as if I was forced to receive the mark of death, like Satan received, the condemnation. And I wouldn't do it. My whole body, he was trying to force me to bow, but I wouldn't do it. And so he kind of put that image in my head. And I just remember he took something like a sword and just hit me with it on the head. I felt this violent strike and I felt dazed. And I felt like I was bleeding too. I, I, in fact, I remember checking my hand to see if there was blood because it was really real to me. And I felt like I had like 30 seconds to die, you know, or maybe a minute. And I wanted to see the sky one last time. And my friend's house was on a one story floor and I, I just felt like I didn't have enough time to go out to the living room, to the kitchen, and out that door. There was a window open to the backyard on the first story, so I just went out of there. And I remember looking at the sky, and it was red. Not just normal red, it was hellish red. And I thought I saw something flying around up there, and I thought I was imagining it at first, because it looked like some kind of a winged dragon or a creature of sorts. And the thing was struggling to stay in the air. It was really flapping really hard. Again, I couldn't visually see it like I could see this tree or the leaf. I could see that the spiritual, and it was very real. I could see it moving around, flapping its wing, and then it swooped down, wide awake. And this thing came really close to me, and I felt it, what I call the sting of death. And I felt in that moment, the guilt of the whole world put on my head. I felt guilty many times in my life. Let's just say this is the maximum guilt I felt in my life. The guilt went to that point and skyrocketed so far and it wouldn't stop. It was way past any controllable measure of guilt and I just felt literally my conscience in the back of my brain, physically I felt it like explode and I felt fire from hell in my mind and going down my spine with excruciating pain as if I was being tormented with hellfire. I, and then I looked at my friend came out. He's like, why'd you jump out the window? I said, first thing I said, I said, hey, Bobby, am I alive? And he said, what are you talking about? I'm like, I don't feel like I'm alive. I feel like I just died, bro. Like literally, I felt wrong being alive. I felt like I went through death. He said, of course you're alive. And kind of didn't believe him so I, I'm like I gotta look into a mirror and I looked into the mirror and there we were standing and I'm like I am alive why do I feel like I'm dead he's like oh you know you're high right now you know you must have been uh, you must be imagining it I'm like no and then that day I remember I stopped everything uh, I, I took an, I tried to lay down I couldn't they were trying to comfort me I, I received no comfort and for the next two to three weeks maybe a month I spent every day asking Jesus to fix this to undo this, to undo this, you know, uh, I would stop everything, you know, as far as all my habits, I would stop, you know, and uh, talk about crying out to the Lord. This pain was so much that I couldn't, I would have to just every hour release tears, just go somewhere like a bathroom. I don't know how I still kept my job at the video store though. I was just putting away videos, it was a very basic job. My manager told me that I couldn't be behind the counter because I looked like a wreck. She didn't know what was going on with me. I wouldn't tell anyone, I would just make up excuses. 
And I would just spend the next, like I said, one month asking Jesus to undo this, and he wouldn't. He wouldn't come through for me. I don't know how long I asked. It could have been a month and a half or two, maybe even three. I don't know. It was a four. Time is kind of blurry for me back then. I was really going through a lot. I just remember, I, instead of asking him to take it away, I started reading the Bible and I started asking for the mind of Christ because my mind was on fire. I still felt the Holy Spirit though, comforting me in my heart, telling me everything, that this is something that, you know, this is something that God has done for a reason. And that this fire I'm feeling might not be forever, even though it felt like I was in an eternal state of punishment, I felt like there was a crack of a door with a light that I might be able to find, but it was going to take everything that I had. So my technique changed. I started fasting a bit till evenings. I started praying five, six, seven hours a day on the ground, crying and just crying and distancing myself from my family. I couldn't even walk into a church. I was the most despised thing on earth in my own mind. You know, insects, animals, pets, children, atheists, everybody had it better than me. I couldn't smile anymore. I felt nothing but pain. I was condemned. I felt like Jesus condemned me, condemned my spirit to shell, to the fire. Maybe not to the extreme fire, but it was a fire nonetheless that was non-stop. Now, I was asking for the spirit of Christ at this point, and the mind of Christ. God knows, maybe 50, 100 times a day. And I think something about 30 days went by. And I was reading the New Testament. At least my goal was five pages a day, not chapters, five pages a day. And I would just take these long walks and just bow on the dirt and just pray and pray and beg and beg and beg unlike anyone had ever begged before. And he wouldn't answer for a while. And I decided, what if he won't answer? What will you do, Alex? And I just decided I'm going to keep doing this till I die. And I started fasting more and more. And I decided life's not worth living. I'm going to fast my way and pray. And he wants to forgive me. I hope he does. If he doesn't, I can't do anything about it. Then I'll die. And I'll go to him. I'll say sorry over there. And if he wants to throw me into hell even more than, than I was feeling now, then that's his decision. But I was going to die trying. You know, I was taking Valium though. I gotta admit, his pain was horrendous and horrific. I stopped, obviously, you know. After, from the time I was asking him to take it away, I was taking Valium. My mom had some at the time. She was sick, I would just take some from her. I told her too what I was going through and so she would give it to me and um, to comfort me. But the fire didn't go away. It just made me a little bit numb to it where it went down from 100% to like 70%, you know. and. I tried even drinking and like smoking weed again to comfort myself and the maximum it would go down was 50% but then when I, all that would wear off it would get even more than before I even took these pills and stuff and then it would kind of go up and down and fluctuate this fire and uh, so yeah so 30 days go by after I stop the pills and I decide I'm gonna go all out just fasting praying give me liberty or give me death. You know, and uh, 30 days went by, still nothing. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna change my method. You know, I'm gonna go to the woods, I'm gonna scream, literally scream to the top of my lungs, Jesus, help me, fix me, give me your spirit. Take me to heaven, I don't wanna be here anymore. Give me your righteousness and mind. And I was just asking for the mind of Christ, the spirit of Christ, and for him to take me up like Elijah to heaven. I mean, I hated this earth at this time being on fire the way he put me on fire, into the fire hurt. It was physical suffering, literal physical pain. And I believe 1 Peter 4.1 talks about this. And I did feel the Father pour out the sins and the guilt and the punishment that Christ received on my head. And I would be telling him, why are you doing this to me? I'm not Jesus. Father, why are you doing this to me? I was praying to the Father for a long time before I switched over to Jesus and I didn't know the difference, I, didn't, I was still kind of 
yeah, there's a Father, yeah, there is Jesus, yeah, they're both God. But I didn't know that Jesus had the Spirit of the Father on him and that Jesus was my Father too. Like He contained the Father in all extensive purposes. Unto us a Son will be born. He will be called Everlasting Father. He will take the role of the Father on humanity and he, we are to go to Jesus and pray to Him. Unless somebody is new and they hadn't asked for the Holy Spirit, but I had. I had done this years before, five years before all this happened to me. I had said that prayer. I had gone to a camp with a girl I was dating, a Christian camp, and you know they made me repeat it, and you know, and I felt the Holy Spirit in my heart. But I had become, you know, what I like to call desolate completely desolate my spirit and one more thing I felt when this happened to me and I felt like I died I literally felt like I fell from heaven I felt like oh my god I had the spirit now I don't like he, he crushed me to the lowest spiritual place and I felt literally even though I was like vertigo or something I felt like I fell from the clouds and hit the ground so hard and I the fall was great and traumatizing and painful so now fast forward, you know, Jesus take it away. He wouldn't take it away. Okay, I'm gonna go all out. None of this junk, no more pills, no more nothing to try to cover up this, this condemnation. And so I started begging Jesus for his spirit and for heaven and for him to come heal me or kill me and take me to heaven. And 30 days I was bowing more and more each day to the point where I was on the ground, just quietly waiting for him. Five, six, seven hours a day and nothing happened. And then I decided I'm gonna go into the forest and scream until I lost my voice. And I did that. I screamed until I had no voice left. And I would go home. The next day I'd get some of my voice back. I'd go out again at night, lose my voice, come back. Third day I went, lose my voice. That night, third day, is when my friend came over, you know, and, uh, and, he, and he slept over. We woke up, and that's when I felt this power in my belly. Unlike anything I'd ever felt, completely supernatural. I felt pregnant with Jesus Christ in my womb, like the baby Jesus in my womb. I don't know how better to explain it than that. That I felt Jesus literally in my womb. I just cannot explain it any better than that. And the second that I read the Bible after this, I felt him, Christ, literally move into my brain and just push out all that fire. And I felt like my mind was immersed in some kind of a living water or some kind of a pool in heaven. I felt Jesus' mind and my mind converge as one. I felt him physically enter my brain. And that night when I went to bed, I had a dream of Christ walking down my street, releasing seven stars out of his right hand, spinning around him, making the night into day, followed by a parade. And then I would go on to have a lot more visions and dreams. Like, that's a dream, I call. You know, sometimes people close their eyes, they might see something. You can call that a vision, I call that an impression. But the reason I do that is because I had a, what I call a vision, where I saw Christ. One day I was reading in the forest, and I was still in the military, I was still in the Marine Corps Reserves at the time, USMC. And, uh, we went training in the summer, and this was right around that time when all this happened to me, the training came. I remember I took a couple of months off, three, three months off of reserves, and then I was going to make up all the lost time on the training, the summer training, which is like one month. But I volunteered to go on the three-week party before and after. So I was there in, uh, for a while in the summer, but I was still continuing my repenting. And I remember I was reading in the forest, not in the forest, in the woods, kind of where we had camp on the side. After lunch, we went. I went, uh, started reading my Bible, sitting down. And all of a sudden, I couldn't move. I couldn't even blink my eyes. I couldn't move a muscle. I couldn't move a finger. I felt zero fear. All fear, all knowledge of sin and death and everyone I've ever known. Even where I was with the Marines, everything left me. All I felt was just peace and love for God and nothing else. And my head was, I was reading the Bible and then it just went up like this towards the sky. And I saw a little star appear and it opened up like a flash 
and I just was looking at the whole sky, the blue of the sky, and like the entire sky was one gigantic lightning field. Just like it says, from east to west, it was all lightning. And I saw Jesus in the middle. Now I know what Stephen was saying where he looked up and he saw Jesus in the midst of the clouds on the right hand, power, you know, and um, like the whole sky was like the Shekinah glory of blue. And Jesus came down so bright. I just remember thinking, this is incredible. I don't understand. I couldn't understand how I was able to view this because it didn't seem humanly possible. But Jesus came down, maybe about 10, 15, 20 feet ahead of me, and he just started coming forward slowly. I don't know if he was taking steps or just gravitating near me, floating. But he just came and within a foot or six inches and he stood me up. I remember he stood me up like this, quickly. I was sitting down, next thing I know, I'm standing like this. And he just comes on me and just stretches himself over me. And I felt this power come in to my face, to my head, to my arms, to my feet. I just felt Jesus pouring himself into me. And just as he came down, then he went back and he went up. And I saw him and then the vision ended and I was released. And then my mind came flooding back, the thoughts of death and everything. But this power remained. Remained from that day until now. And actually this power has increased like a tree. I would say it's been growing without anything of my own doing. You know, without me even having anything to do with it. All on its own. Growing and growing and growing. I felt Jesus growing in me physically. Literally growing in me, through me. And he would come to me in visions, uh, I mean in dreams, excuse me. Literally he came up to me and I'm, you know, like, who are you Lord? And he said, or, or just who are you? He said, I'm Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Alex. And then he would give me the message. Many, many times he identified himself to me as Jesus Christ of Nazareth, so I would have no doubt. Just like Paul, he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. You know, because other spirits can come. You need to test the spirits. But sometimes when you have a dream, you don't have the knowledge to test the spirits. You're just a witness. But other times he'll give you the ability, especially if you ask him. And over the years he has come to me in dreams. I don't know how many times. You know, I've lost count. And that's a blessing. And don't think I'm a... I'm anything more than completely and utterly humbled by this experience that Jesus Christ has mercifully granted me. That I know the will of the Father is to make everybody into His Son's image. And, but we need to give up everything. Also going back to that day where I was seeking Him to kill my spirit at my friend Bobby's house to, to crucify me. I remember in my heart and in my mind just, just this question rang out. Alex, are you willing to remain for me? Are you willing to give up everything for me? Are you willing to give up wives and jobs and everything for me? And I said, yes, Jesus, if you do this, I will remain single for you. I know some of you are married and that's fine. You can still receive the mind of Christ and spirit of Christ. But as Paul says, with mutual consent, you should separate for a time and be completely devoted to the Lord. And once Jesus actually marries your flesh and your husband's flesh or your wife's flesh, then you'll understand, like mature children, that we're here to marry Christ. We were promised one husband, Christ, and that we should all be presented as pure virgins to Him. Paul said it is better for a man not to touch a woman, but because there is so much immorality, it's acceptable for each of you to take your own wife. Now. Not that it's a compromise, but the stubbornness of the people's heart, you know, the faithlessness of people that, oh, you know what? My lust is too much for you, Lord. No, I have to go marry someone to, to, to quench that lust because, you know, it seems to me impossible for you to fix this, right, Lord? And then they go and they make a decision. But marriage is great. Family is great. Everything has a season. But what did Paul say again? He said, for those who are married, they ought to become like those who are not because the time is short. Peter said to set your hope on the grace which will be revealed when Jesus Christ comes. 
set your hope in the grace that is to be revealed to you when Jesus Christ comes. Look forward to the day of the Lord, said Peter, and hasten its coming. That day, the elements will be burned up. It will be a day of darkness. You know, and when you call on the Lord, get ready for Jesus to deal with your sin. Not just to forgive it. He needs to deal with it with fire. Everyone will be cleansed with fire, said Jesus. Everyone will be salted with fire. Now this isn't zeal. Oh, I'm excited and zealous for the Lord. That's the zeal of the Lord will accomplish a lot of His will to the prophets said the zeal of the Lord will accomplish the bringing back of the remnant. But the fire, the baptism of fire, it's a literal, your spirit takes, Jesus pours fire, like something like hot sulfur from heaven into you to cleanse you. Just like this land here, when there's a fire, it refertilizes the soil. And discipline doesn't feel good when, it, when you're going through it. But we must taste and drink of the bitter cup Christ drank. And we must be baptized in His death. We must be baptized into His suffering. And we must be baptized into every single emotion Jesus felt. Every physical pain He felt. We've all had our own physical pain in our life. Our own, my parents got divorced, I had injuries, I had problems. Yes, I know some of you too have had problems. That's your problem. That's my problem. Jesus suffers along with us in our physical flesh through the Holy Spirit because He searches hearts and minds through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is just a part of God. The Godhead, the complete Godhead, God has decided to... I'm going to wait till this helicopter goes away. Okay. God decided to just give us a little bit of His fullness called the Holy Spirit. And we are to now, that helps us believe in Him, that helps us get convicted of sin, that helps us cry out for forgiveness, that helps us believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the problem is, people don't know what to do next because they're looking at other human examples. And there are not that many people who claim to have the Spirit of Christ that Jesus Christ came into me head to toe, that Jesus Christ is the one who married my flesh. Their testimony is about the Holy Spirit. You know, that the Holy Spirit does this, the Lord speaks to me through the Holy Spirit, and that's all well and good, and their message is 100% correct on 50% of the message. You know, you'll see other preachers, and I will go ahead and name them, you know, like Jan Bashoff, Robert Light, warning the people, all these other Christians out there that I've seen, and I've had the Lord show someone who I was, you know, discipling dreams about them because they were looking up to these preachers, and they, he, they, and she saw dreams of these preachers here, these evangelists, and she saw that they were on the same road, that they had still not conquered the demons, that they still had not found the promised land, that Jesus Christ Himself was not formed in them yet, you know. And I will not tell you the kinds of dreams she saw about me because it's, I don't like to repeat things like that, self-exalting, but the Lord has Himself shown other people about me, you know? And it says that they will not accept praise from others. Their, their praise comes from God. And Jesus has been testifying to people who do pray about this testimony, if they can trust it or not. You know, I'm earnestly telling everyone that's watching this message, and I'll pray. Dear Jesus, upon whom the fullness of the Father dwells in bodily form, Jesus, please, let anyone who watches this message right now, if they pray along and ask you to confirm in a dream or a vision, per 2 Corinthians 12, 1, I say that so I can prove to them that it's scriptural, Numbers 12, 6 through 8. Please answer them, Jesus, and let them share this dream with, the, with me on this video in the comment section or to message me personally off of my Facebook link that's on my, my Facebook link that's on my main channel on the homepage of my YouTube. Let them come. Let them go ahead and tell me what they've seen and let us pray and let us seek. But Jesus Christ, you must 
Lord, you must deal with the sin problem in a human being. You're not coming into an unfertilized field. We are sowing seeds. This is the field of God. And you yourself must, with your winnowing, with your fan the flame, Lord, in, in, in a person. Let them be completely taken out of the way. Let the son of perdition, the spirit of sin, in a man or woman, be completely revealed and destroyed at your coming. Jesus, please, let them ask you about the second coming and answer them, Lord. Please, the second coming is a personal second coming. It's not a global event. It's a personal one-on-one -on -one experience. Anybody on earth that dies, immediately they're in the realm of the Spirit. They will see the sky that I was shown, the realm of the Spirit, the Lord's day. They will see Jesus. Every single eye will see, and every single tongue will confess Jesus is the Lord. Because when they die, they're going to be in truth. Now, whether a demon takes them to the gates of Hades, or whether the angel takes them to sleep, or whether they come glorified into your temple, the third temple that's prepared, you know, uh, if they, whether they come straight into the wedding, that's up to you, that's up to them, that's up to them to examine themselves, to see whether or not they're in the faith, if Christ does dwell within them, unless they fail the test. And I hope you know that, that when Paul is saying, we won't fail this test, he's talking about himself and the apostles who have received the fullness of Christ. Paul, who took three years and went into Arabia before even meeting Peter once. He did not consult with any human being or any of the existing churches or apostles. Paul went independently with Christ, and then after he was made complete, after he went through his time of suffering, then he came out. You know, and my point here today is only to encourage everyone here to get on their knees and to pray a prayer, one prayer, for Jesus to confirm in a vision. You can't trust your heart. Oh, my heart tells me that you're false, or my heart tells me I believe you. Whether you believe me or not, I can care less. I want you to bow down and ask Jesus to come confirm it to you himself through the Holy Spirit in a vision or a dream. Okay, I want you to set your hearts on this for the dreams and visions, and I want you to forsake all the worldliness, video games, YouTube videos. Do not call anyone a teacher. I'm not your teacher, I'm your brother. I'm your brother testifying to what Jesus said, I'm a witness. I'm just telling you, preaching to you, what I've seen with my eyes, what I've touched with my hands, what I've tasted. These are the things that I am testifying to you concerning the Word. The Word is Jesus. The Bible isn't the Word of God. The Bible is Scripture. When the Bible talks about the Word, or the Word of the Lord came to me, the Word of Elohim came to me, it's talking about Jesus Christ came. Take the sword of the Spirit, take the Word, it's talking about take Jesus with you. Most people do not have Jesus in them. He's with them. He's with you right now, no doubt. He's standing before I stand at the door and knock. But whoever opens the door, I will come into that person. But you have to dread and fear God with all your might. That's the door. I remember that day I was so scared of what I was asking for. I was so scared of God. I was really scared of God. I was even scared of the devil because God created the devil. And it's a scary thing. It's a monster over us, you know. And, but I knew this. God created the devil. It's God's creation. So my fear and reverence for Christ that day, I, I think I could safely say I had never been more scared in my life than when I had the realization that I'm evil and I'm a devil who comes to Christ every time asking for forgiveness. I was scared almost to the point of a nervous but I think I felt like I had a nervous breakdown actually and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom but most people including me at that time I didn't want to fear God I didn't want to fear Jesus as God I did not I wanted oh I want to love God because love feels good fear doesn't so I refused to fear and I always justified it well no we got to love God with all our heart well can you love God with all your heart when you're sinning can you love God while you're, you know, sleeping with a woman? Why for not? Can you love God while you're watching a movie or listening to music? No, you love the music, the melodies in a person 
uplift their soul and they try to feel some kind of a connection through music to God, to me it's complete idolatry, complete uh, wickedness actually, you know, and the truth of the matter is Jesus himself said, many will try to enter, but only a few will find. Do not be deceived. We have the mind of Christ, said Paul. But Paul says we and you, talking to the church, and then talking about we as in the apostles. Sometimes he includes himself like with the overall we, but other times you've got to read the Bible very carefully. Like 2 Corinthians 13, 5, 6, I said earlier. Examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I hope you know we won't fail. He said, you are honored. We are dishonored. You are this. We are that. I'll post these scriptures with these videos. I'm sure you can see it now because I'm going to do it later. But don't exalt yourself. Lower yourself. If you want to become first... If you wanted, Jesus said, I am the first. I'm the beginning and the end. And Jesus tells Peter, you will be called the rock. If you want to become like Christ on, in heaven and on earth, you must become the last. There's a spiritual golden ladder. On the top sits Jesus. On the bottom is the devil. Humans are kind of here. You want to be first? You're not going to uplift yourself to that point. God's going to keep pushing you down. Try to listen to music and love God. He's going to push you down. Stop sinning for a month. God will still push you down. Sin will come back. Why? Because you need to be lowered to the lowest place first. The place called fire. And, and from there, you can go buy and sell from Christ. He's willing to give you His Spirit. Come buy from me. Salve to put in your eyes so you can see. White clothes to wear. To cover up your nakedness. You think you are rich, but you don't know that you're poor, miserable, naked, and wretched, and blind. This is in Revelations. And when it says that the beast had power to deceive the whole world, and all the people, all the people, all the people were forced to receive a mark. This is talking about honesty. This is talking about all the people in the world are forced to receive a mark. Everyone's going to be marked for death. As soon as you die, you're going to be thrown into the fire. If you have not seen Jesus Christ come to you per Acts 1.11, if you haven't seen Him come to you per 1 Peter 1.13, if you haven't seen Him come to you per John 14.21, in John 14, a chapter Jesus three times opened up in my dream, teaching me with his finger, talk, telling me, uh, okay, this is where the Holy Spirit comes. But this part is not about the Holy Spirit. This part is about me. I come after the Holy Spirit and go tell them. Identifying himself as Jesus of Nazareth. And after he, he taught me the chapter, he turned my shoulder and had me preach to a multitude. Three separate times he did this. You know, I've gone in a dream into ancient Israel to see how the Israelites used to live. He took me into a cave in a vision through the Holy Spirit. I felt like I was a part of the air looking at the priests of Israel, with buckets of blood, throwing it on each other, and uh, having insects on the wall, creepy weird things that they were worshipping, weird spiders, kind of big ones, and all these beetles and bugs and these poles that had carved and wearing like black outfits. They looked completely demonic and they were teaching people to do the same. So God destroyed them and his anger was uh, made fierce. And they tempted the God of Israel, Jesus Christ, and he came down on them hard. Paul says it was Jesus Christ who was leading the Israelites, that that water they drank was Christ, that Jesus Christ is the God of Israel. And if anyone hasn't received the Spirit of Christ, and they don't belong to Christ. It's simple as that. And the step one is to admit you don't have it, and then to wait patiently until you do. This is where I think Christians and Christianity has been completely and utterly deceived by the devil. They tell you if you say this one prayer and believe that that's it. Where Paul says in, what is it, Romans 8, 24, 25, that who hopes for what he already has? But if we're praying and asking for something we do not yet have, we must wait for it patiently. 
Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock, then the door will be opened. Don't just jump in yourself and say, I have to, I, I'm saved because I believed and I confessed and I said the sinner's prayer. That's not biblical. If you believe in Jesus, you're going to do everything that Jesus said. If you take his words and put it into practice, then you build your house on the rock. But if you take his words and don't put them into practice, you build your hand on the, su on the sand and the floods will rise, crash against that house and his fall will be complete. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit must be cut down and thrown into the fire. That was me. He cut me down, he threw me in the fire, and then he gave me a new seed, a new tree. If you're a bad tree, you can't bear good fruit. Stop trying. You can only be cut down and thrown into the fire. Then you can ask to become a new tree. This is the Bible. This is the true gospel of Jesus Christ. That you need to understand the fear of the Lord. Either stop, if you stop sinning and you just keep praying for Jesus to come to you, you'll get there. But your mind and heart must be fixed on Him appearing to you from heaven. 1 John 3 talks about it. Again, 1 Peter 1.13 talks about it. Paul says we must wait for the Lord to come from heaven. The message rang out from among you. 1 Thessalonians 1. How he turned away from idols to the living God and wait to wait for the Son of God to come from heaven. It's a beautiful thing when Jesus comes. But he's not coming until you're, you're completely cleansed of your inequity. You can sin no more today, but your sin is in you still. It's a history. It's recorded. Jesus must burn it out with fire. That's why it says the, fear, the, the cowardly and the fearful will not inherit the kingdom. That's why it says they did not love their life so much as to shrink from death. That's why it says come buy from me, buy and sell, come buy from me, salve to put on your eyes. And they could not buy and sell until they received the mark of the beast. That's what it says. You need, you're like the devil. He's marked for death, condemnation. Until you are, just like I was, for a time, you're not going to hear nothing from Jesus. It's all in your brain. It's all delusion or the devil or demons or spirits. I don't know. Holy Spirit does talk to us, yes, but most times and not, all these people who pray to Jesus and they close their eyes right away and get an answer are being led by demons. They're being led by the Antichrist that sits on the throne pretending to be Christ. Because Christ has a seat. But Satan is sitting on that seat. That, that, that throne is called the heart. That's why the heart is the most deceitful thing of all. And that's why the heart is what needs to be circumcised and become new, a new heart. That's why we have a mind of Christ given to us. Not just a heart, but the mind of Christ, the power of Christ coming in your mind. That's why I don't need a Bible when I go preach. You know, He is the Bible in me. He brings to remembrance any scripture that I need in the moment. So it says, repent and be zealous. You know, repent and be zealous. Just cry out to the Lord. Will God keep putting off those who seek Him day and night? See, you have to cry out day and night. And it says God will put you off for a while. But will God keep putting you off? Will He, will he keep putting those off who cry out day and night? No. If, if there's a type of person who's crying out day and night, then he will eventually answer them, and rather quickly. The problem is, the devil tells you you're saved and you believe it. Even though you know you are not, sometimes, or you question it, you take the easy way out. It's a very difficult pill to swallow to say you're not saved yet, because you're being saved. Until Jesus comes into you, head to toe, you're not saved. Till you see him from heaven, you're not saved but they will see his face and his name will be written on their forehead. It's not a metaphorical face, it's a real face. Jesus Christ has a face and he has a smile, he has hands, he has feet, he has form. He will come to you and he will talk to you. But are you one with him? Have you given up everything? It says he who gives up wives, houses, fields will in no less inherit even more. But. Do you feel like you should be condemned with Jesus Christ? Do you want to share in His sufferings? Do you want to be made like Him in His death? Are you ready to look at yourself as a child of a devil, of the devil, instead of a child of God? You can look at yourself as a child of God. That's fine with me. That's fine with God. But are you a son of God? A son belongs to it forever. Have you, if you haven't seen the Son of God, if He hasn't come to you, and in fact, if He hasn't come into your entire being, then you're lying. 
to yourself about your salvation and you're not going to be able to spiritually grow. God's going to keep crushing you and you're going to suffer and you're going to have no joy, lasting joy. You have temporary joy, but lasting joy you won't have. He won't give it to you. You'll question your faith, you'll question your salvation, you'll be confused because that's the truth. The truth is human beings need to be stripped of everything like Job and then he'll restore after he does the taking away of everything. Well, I've lost so much, Alex. You know, I've suffered so much. You know, I had, my daughter had this sin and my granddaughter had this. It's to happen to me. And well, you should have remained single for Christ. All that suffering is because of you. You made a decision to follow your own way. You didn't want to serve Jesus complete and wholeheartedly. There's times even now I were burned inwardly. I'm 40 years old, still single. There are times now where I'm like, I feel Jesus in me head to toe, but my nature is still there. I must crucify it every day. But at the same time, Jesus is in me, pouring out so much power and love and grace and coming to me so much that it just makes it possible. But I ask you to ask yourself, have you shared in Christ's sufferings? Have you been made like him in his death? Have you received and participated in the resurrection of his spirit in your body? No, the resurrection has not happened. Not like the way, you know, these false Christians were preaching in Paul's time. Telling people, oh, you know what? The resurrection already happened. Up, oh, too bad, you missed out. That's not the message. The message is you must personally attain the resurrection. You must suffer with Christ and be put to death on the cross and be crucified with him. And Jesus Christ, the same power that lifted Christ from the dead will give power to these mortal bodies. It says in Romans, Jesus said, patiently wait until you're clothed with power from on high. Jesus said, I will come to you. You will see me. On that day, you'll realize I am in you. You are in me. I am in the Father. On that day, again, this is John 14. Father, in John 17, Father, I pray that they become one. I pray that they become one just as we are one. I've given them the glory so that they may be one, just as we are one. I think the, at the end of John 17, it says, Father, that I might be in them. Stop calling the Holy Spirit Jesus Christ. It's offensive. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. Jesus Christ has his own persona. In Christ, was the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. He's, you see Jesus, you see God. You don't see three gods, you see one God. But in Christ is the Holy Spirit and the Father, and they dwell as one. Just like I have my body, but my spirit searches my mind. Right? Just like that, well, God's Spirit searches the mind of Christ. And He has a body too, and upon His body is the Father. It's all too complicated for some people to understand. You know, and like the Bible says, those with the Spirit speak the words of God. The man of God, the man that God sends, speaks the words of God. Because when the Spirit is given, it's given without limit. And a lot of people have a, a little bit limited version of the Holy Spirit in them. They haven't received the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Because they haven't humbled themselves in their own mind. They haven't humbled themselves to six. Humans are six. The number six. This calls for wisdom. Let him who have wisdom calculate the number. It's six, 666. Right? That number, what is that number? It's a man's number. Is it a man's? A man? One man? What is that word? A man. It's a number of a man. Well, you got to do your own research. But if you go to the Strong's Concordance, the blue letter, and you look up that word, Anthropos, I think it's called. Like the same root word that anthropology, the study of mankind. That's that word. Anthropos. It's not a anthropos. It's the number of a man. Anthropos. Definition. All living human beings on earth, male or female, made weak, made into a weaker than the angels, other than the angels and Elohim God. There is no human antichrist coming. You want to see the antichrist? Go look in the mirror. And until you accept that fact, you're not going to see Jesus. 
and you're not going to receive his fullness, and you're not going to even have power or victory over sin. Oh, rejoice, rejoice. No, cry, grieve, wail, and mourn until he comes. When you see him face to face, and he comes into you, and he cleanses you, and he takes your spirit into the kingdom of heaven, and you feel like you're flying in the clouds, because that's where you'll be if all this happens, then you can rejoice. Then you can rejoice. I pray, Jesus, that you uh, touch the hearts of everybody here listening to this message, Lord. I pray that you show them dreams and visions as you have my dear friends, Sandra, Krista, James, just to name a few. Justin, these are just the recent ones. Sandy, you know who you are. And, um, uh, there's a lot of people out there seeking the kingdom. And a lot of them have seen that they're going to have to receive the fire. And when they receive the fire, when you partake in it, then you will know that Jesus Christ is coming soon. Because unless he pours out his sufferings, he's not going to pour out his glory. So I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, our Lord, our Savior, that you pray about this and, and, and you cut yourself off from all worldly TV, media, drinking, partying, friends, movies. Get serious. Stay serious. Stay serious till you see him face to face. There's a joker in a human being that makes you want to LOL, ha ha ha. That's the devil that makes you want to take away all sense of seriousness and to make light of things. So please, in the name of Jesus Christ, Come back and write to me what you saw in your dreams and visions. Please, I beg of you, I plead with you. Do not quit, do not let the devil deceive you to think you have the mind of Christ until you see him face to face. When we see him, then we'll be made like him. And all who have this hope in Christ purify themselves, just as Christ is pure. 1 John 3. I love you all, and I hope that you guys receive every single spiritual gift under the sun, and when you go to heaven, you sit with Christ eternally. But I, more than that, I pray that you receive that on earth as it is in heaven. God bless you all.